If you have your Bible, would you please open it in the New Testament to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read from verse 50 through to the end of the chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And so when this incorruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Mm -hmm. If you have lived in Andalusia for some time, you know that one of the main attractions that you are asked frequently to revisit with uh, friends who are coming in from other parts of the world is the little town of Ronda which is a kind of a quintessential Spanish town down here in the south. And it is renowned not only for the bullfighting ring, which you can go visit. Um, I've never been there when there's a bull, but it's a strange thing that happens when people get into the middle of the bullfighting ring in Rona. They act like bulls, and you see them going around with their fingers pointed into the air. Um, that's not the only thing that's interesting. It is especially known for a bridge uh, which traverses a chasm, uh, the famous Ronda Bridge, which was built between 1751 and 1793. It was a huge project. Some of it reminds me of the Ponta Dolce in Luxembourg, which was built much later, in the beginning of the 20th century and which, when it was completed, was the largest single-span stone bridge in the world. Um, Ronda's bridge was the world's highest bridge when it was completed, almost 100 meters from the bottom to the top. And if you know something about the Ronda Bridge, you know that first attempts were not successful, the thing collapsed. Many people died in the process, and so it had, it had to be re-engineered. And if you cross it today, it uh, is reasonably safe. The old town of Ronda, which I guess would be on the south side, had very little future. It was just a pile of rocks eroded long ago by water, and the chasm between the old town and what would become the new town had to be bridged by the Ronda Bridge in order for the old town to move into an area of expansion. And this became very important in the 18th and 19th centuries. And today, if you go to Ronda, you probably spend more time in the new town than you do in the old. Economic expansion needed a bridge over the chasm, and it was the Puente Nuevo, which made that possible. 
And it, if I can kind of uh, make that into a metaphor, I think we can apply it to the situation that we see described in 1 Corinthians 15. Because we too face a valley which all of us m must cross sooner or later if we're going to have an eternal future. Our passage for this evening in 1 Corinthians 15 tells us about the bridge, the only bridge worthy of our trust that God has created to get us from the one side to the other and to protect us on the other side forever. The old town is this life. The new town is God's eternal dwelling place, his eternal kingdom, and the bridge is the transformation of our physical body, which is achieved by the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection power. No idol, Psalm 115, can possibly accomplish this. This is a unique miracle that the Lord Jesus can do, and it is something he himself has experienced in the resurrection of his own body. We are at the end of a series, a very short series of messages on the theme of the rapture of the church. And you'll remember if you've been here for some time that we covered John chapter 14, where Jesus said to his disciples that he was going to go away and that there were many mansions in his father's house. If it were not so, he would have told them and that he was going to go away and prepare a place for them and would return to take them to be with himself. First mention of the notion of the catching away of the church by Christ at his return for the church. We also looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which speaks specifically about the return of Christ for the church and the resurrection of those who are dead in Christ and the transformation of the body of those who are still alive when Christ returns for the church. We suggested as well in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the Bible's reference to the apostasy, the falling away, which must come uh, before the revelation of the man of sin, uh, is better translated the departure. And apostasy is a departure from truth, but this passage can also refer to a departure from the earth. And uh, we suggested reasons why 2 Thessalonians 2 in those opening verses is a reference to the catching away of the church at the return of Christ for the church. And then last month we looked at Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, and saw the unique promise that uh, Jesus gave to the church at Philadelphia and to all the churches which were reading these letters in Revelation 2 and 3. To the effect that um, in God's mercy he would not, that, that he would preserve believers in Christ from the time uh, of testing, the time of trouble which was to come upon the whole earth and we come tonight to a final passage, which does not include the term rapture, but refers to what is going to happen to believers when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So I would like to move through this passage, beginning in verse 50, and go to the end, and using our metaphor of the chasm in Ronda and the bridge that takes us from the old town to the new town, kind of think our way through how the Apostle Paul develops this notion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, Paul is presenting a problem, uh, uh, summarizing, I should say, his treatment of a, a problem that he has been addressing all the way through this lengthy chapter. There were some people in the church at Corinth who challenged the idea of a resurrection of the body. They apparently thought, perhaps they had been involved by, uh, in, involved in some neo-Gnostic teaching that diminished the importance of the material world and raised up and glorified the uh, immaterial world, uh, very influenced by Platonic thinking uh, around four centuries before. And uh, we know that by the time the second century came around, Gnosticism was a full-blown theory, and it uh, basically said that it didn't matter what you did in your body because your body was an evil thing, and if you wanted to be moral, 
good for you, but it would not have any eternal value. And if you wanted to be immoral, it didn't matter anyway because the body was just, well, you live in a dirty world. And, and so don't worry about what you do in your body uh, because the ultimate reality is completely spiritual. And therefore, God is not going to be concerned about resurrecting, remaking the body of the believer. Um, you, you cannot be rescued, they said, from a polluted world by the resurrection of the body. Of course, the Old Testament had foreseen the resurrection of the body, not in all that much detail. But they were not too concerned about what the Old Testament had to say on this. Their claim basically was, you live in Old Town, Ronda, there will be no New Town, Ronda. You will go into the ether waves and live forever without a body. The Christian future was in a purely immaterial world of pure spirit and ideas and forms. And Paul responds to this notion that was circulating in Corinth and says, no, 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 no. That's not the way it goes. And he took great pains to explain that this was not true. First of all, if there was no resurrection, he pointed out, then Jesus could not have been raised from the dead. And if that were true, then, my friend, all of you Christians are still in your sins. The whole gospel message would fail because there must be not only the death of the Messiah, but also his resurrection from the dead. Uh, otherwise, you don't know if Jesus died for his own sins or if he died for yours. If there is no resurrection, there is no resurrection of Jesus. And if there is no resurrection of Jesus, there is no guarantee of forgiveness of your sins. And after discussing many other details about the resurrection body, he now comes at the end of the chapter to this very important point, which is, we cannot live with God forever in our present bodies. Now, depending upon how old you are, you may or may not be convinced of that. There aren't that many young people with us tonight. We are. Well, maybe I shouldn't make any further comments. <laughs> I suspect that most of you are convinced by now that if you were to see God in his glory, in the body that you're living in now, you would not survive. It's hard enough to survive without seeing the glory of God. You remember Moses wanted to see the glory of God? Could God show me your glory? And God said to him, I'll let you see the tail end get into this rock here, there's a little crevasse, hide yourself from me, and I'm going to walk by. And the effect was so unbelievably impactful. I don't know if that's a real world word today, but we use it. That um, Moses' face shone, and people were afraid to look at him because they knew that the glory would eventually fade away. If that was true, then certainly we would be annihilated by a vision of the full glory of God in our present bodies. And furthermore, our natural bodies are under the curse and are perishing. As we see in the preceding arguments, you'll have to read through the rest of 1 Corinthians 15 to understand that. But there are three important things that Paul underscores in verse 50. It's a very short sentence, but I want you to see these three things. Number one, the kingdom of God is coming. This I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. To inherit something is different from possessing it today. Therefore, the kingdom of God is future. The view that the kingdom of God is already here, visibly, in the form of the Christian church, has created untold confusion in the history of Christianity. In a few weeks, I'll be going up to Luxembourg to give 30 hours of lectures on the history of the church. And I've just been reading uh, 
in the last few weeks about what some people did in the name of Christianity in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. You have the wars of religion. You have people who claimed to lead the Christian church who were unspeakably corrupt. They were politicians, they were immoral. It was all about money and power and influence. But this was done in the name of the notion that the church was the kingdom of God. And that the church must have influence, and make the kings, and determine how society should be structured. The church should not just be present in the world, but must be of the world. It must bring a so-called Christianized influence into the world to make the world into a place where God can establish his kingdom, a kind of a theocracy. By remembering that the kingdom of God, the visible expression of God's sovereign rule, is future, we're far more likely to stick with God's program for the church, which is to be a witness in a fallen world, to call lost people to repentance and faith in Christ, and then learn to grow up into him in maturity in local church families that reproduce as the generations pass. That is our mission. It is not to make the world into a theocracy. The kingdom of God is future. Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It is implicitly something that is down the road for us. Secondly, I want you to notice in this sentence that the kingdom of God is the realm of eternal life because he says in the parallel statement, this is a very Jewish writer here, he always introduces these parallels to kind of unpack the implications of his first statement. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So that the kingdom of God is related to the notion of what cannot break down over time as a result of sin. Now there are many references to the kingdom of God in the Bible which focus on God's messianic kingdom where God is going to rule from Jerusalem through his anointed king, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ for a thousand years. But there are many other references in the Bible that talk about the rule of God and the kingdom of God in a larger sense. And in that larger sense, God has always ruled the world. And I believe that this reference to the kingdom of God is speaking of this actual primary sense, which is often referred to in Psalms, which talk about God um, ruling forever and ever through all generations. At all times, God is ruling the world, and uh, this will uh, be ultimately expressed in heaven when the Messiah, having ruled a thousand years, gives up his rule to his Father. This is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. That Messiah will rule visibly upon the earth for a thousand years. There are specific purposes to that visible rule of Jesus. And that he is going to yield up that rule to the Father so that the original intent of God and his creation is restored. Now to get into that eternal rule, flesh and blood, which is perishable, which is corruptible, cannot enter in. <coughs> Paul must be talking about that eternal aspect because in the time of the kingdom of the Messiah, there will be people in flesh and blood, just like you have flesh and blood. It's going to be a rule of Christ on this earth, and there will be people in that kingdom who will rule Christ, who have glorified bodies, and there will be people living in that kingdom who have natural bodies, like you and I do. If you have questions on that, we can talk about it after the service or at another time. Paul is thinking about the eternal aspect of the kingdom of God, which is part of this new future imperishable order of things. And in order to live in that imperishable kingdom, people will need new bodies adapted 
to eternity. Your present body is not enough. In the kingdom of the Father, everyone will have a glorified body. Without exception. That will be the case for those who are condemned to the lake of fire. They will have a transformed, I should say, they will not have a glorified body, they will have a resurrected body, so that they will be able to live forever in a state of eternal banishment from the presence of God. And those who love God and who are in Christ will have a glorified, resurrected body. The old town of Ronda will be finished. One will have crossed the bridge, and the only way you can live in the new town is to have a transformed physical but it is going to be as real and material and yet different mm. from what you live in now. It is going to be nonetheless a material body. Transform. If you want more details on that, you'll have to wait and see how it works out. Because we don't have all the details we would love to have. I suppose... Well, I shouldn't speculate, should I? Isn't it tempting to speculate on these things? Uh, I, but I think I can safely say I will not need glasses. <laughs> but to get to that place of renewal, you need a bridge. You can't go from old Ronda to new Ronda easily. And you can say, well, I'll just climb down to the chasm and scale up to the top. Um, that's where the metaphor breaks down. You need the bridge. To get into the kingdom of God, our natural bodies are not bridge enough. You can't jump from one to the other. The chasm is wide enough so that you can't make this on your own. No human merit will allow you to pass from your present life to eternal life. Any religion in this world, outside of the Christian truth, really proposes a variant of a common idea, which is by religion A, B, C, D, E, F, or G, pull up your socks, be a better person, make such and such a pilgrimage, give a certain amount of money, pray certain prayers, get an education, do this, do that, and maybe you'll have a chance to make it into the presence of God. The Bible says that no human merit is enough. We need someone to stand in our place, and that someone is only one person in the history of the world, Jesus Christ the Lord, who lived a perfect life, died as a representative, as a substitute for us, was buried, was raised again the third day, and appeared to many to prove that his resurrection was true. That's the deep valley over which, the chasm over which, we must go. There must be a transformation of the body to get from the old to the new. So look at verses 51 to 53 to see the indestructible bridge which God has provided. He says, first of all, in the beginning of verse 51, that not all believers will die. Behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery is not an Agatha Christie crime novel mystery. Can you see if you can figure it out with the clues? It's not that kind of a mystery. The mysterion in the Greek language of the New Testament is a new truth now revealed, hidden in the past, but now declared. Here is new revelation. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The new truth is simply that not all believers, that's the we, will actually die. The word sleep is a euphemism for death. All the way through 1 Corinthians, you see it used many times in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You see it in chapter 11 where Paul talks about the Lord's table. There are many who participate in the Lord's table in Corinth, he says, uh, in an unworthy way. And some of them are sickly and some actually sleep. They've died. And the metaphor is used a number of times also in chapter 15, in verse 6, 18, 20, and here 51. If it is true of the dead that their bodies cannot be suited to eternal life, it is also true 
of living believers that their bodies are not suited for eternity. Think about this a moment. Let's say the Lord Jesus comes back tonight to take the church to be with himself. There are many people in the last 2,000 years who have put their trust in Christ who are entombed. Their bodies have turned to dust. It is obvious that they need the resurrection to be able to be caught up to be with Christ. You don't have to be a genius to figure that one out if there needs to be a body that gets into eternity. But what about you, if you're still alive, when Christ returns, isn't your body good enough? And the answer is no. You also need to be transformed. The bodies of living believers are not suited for eternity. Neither decayed flesh and blood, nor aging flesh and blood will do. This is the same truth that Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. There would be a miraculous resurrection of the body, of the dead and of the living, who would still be alive when Christ caught up the church to be with himself. And furthermore, this event is imminent. There is no prophecy in scripture that must be fulfilled before Christ welcomes his people into his presence. It's going to occur before seven years of tribulation and testing, which is to come upon the earth, Revelation 3.10. And it would be a wonderful thing if our generation experienced this incredible transformation of the body. Not all believers will die. But he says at the end of verse 51 that we shall all be changed. All believers will be changed. So those who have died in Christ and those who are still alive when Christ returns for his church, all will be changed. Now this is not a slogan to put over the door of the church nursery. This is a statement about the complete transformation of the human body of the believer in Christ. And it's going to happen not through a process, but it's going to occur fast. Because it says in verse 52, which is a continuation of the sentence, started in verse 51, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. Think about it this way, in the twinkling of an eye. The word twinkling of an eye is the King James translator's effort to get across this idea of a rapid eye movement. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, if you're not a native English speaker, I don't know if you know the word twinkling. Maybe you think about twinkling at Christmas time as a word used to describe Christmas ornaments. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, right? Kind of. Mm, mm, mm. A, a, a twinkle, if it lasts too long, it is no longer twinkling. A twinkle is a. It lights up and then it's gone. It is a good metaphor, a good word to, to use to get across this notion of a rapid eye movement. It's the speed of a glance. It's the blink of an eye, if you wish. The word that's used here for change, it will be changed in the, the twinkling of an eye is the term that's used also in Romans chapter 1, verse 23. For the exchange that the world made, the pagan world, between the glory of the incorruptible God and the silly image of idols that we've read about in Psalm 115. This exchange that people made in antiquity is going to be reversed. And we will exchange the frailty and the corruption of the natural body for the glory of, an, of a glorified body. And it will not be a gradual process. It's going to be over in a flesh. You will not be able to 
measure it and say, oh, I see things are improving. Oh, look at that. Uh, we have a little bit of hair added to the scalp. And oh, we have a little more muscular frame. Uh, and uh, there's hope here. It, no, it's going to be instantaneous, this transformation. Jesus did these kinds of things when he operated uh, various miracles in his ministry. You remember what he did in Genesis chapter 1, uh, all through those seven days of creation? He said, let there be light, and there was light. It was not a process where we have to over <coughs> billions and billions of years try to tease some light out of nothingness. We see Jesus do this kind of thing in John chapter 2 at the marriage of Canaan. Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes to Jesus, obviously hoping that he is going to reveal his messianic identity, and says, uh, they are out of wine. And he says to his mother, basically, mind your own business. Yes. What to you and what to me? This is a Hebrew idiom, which means this is not something for you to worry about. You let me set the agenda. But he does turn water into wine, and that is not something that took the same amount of time that water usually takes to be transformed from rainwater going down into the ground, watering the vine coming out in succulent fruits, and then having people put them in a wine vat, press them with their feet, letting them go into uh, wine bottles and ferment just the, the right, you know, decant. So that whole process takes many months, and depending upon what kind of wine you're talking about, it may take several years. Jesus doesn't need several years to make new wine for the wedding feast of Cana. He says to the men, um, now go, go over there to those vats, vats, no, what do you call these things? Pinochas. Uh, I, I knew it. I would be able to come up with that word uh, sooner or later. Uh, go decanter the water and uh, put them into the vessels then to serve the wine at the table. It was an instantaneous transformation. Because Jesus is the creator, he can do things instantaneously like that. Think about the instantaneous disappearance of Jesus from the sight of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. At one moment he's talking to them, and then all of a sudden, bing, he's gone. That's what the text indicates. And he reappears to the other disciples at a great distance the same night and reproves them for their unbelief. And think about what the texts tell us about the transformation of a believing sinner from being, from being a lost person to being a saved person. John 5, 24. If you have trusted the gospel, you have passed from death to life. Is that a process? Now, there are many people who would call themselves Christians today who believe that justification is a process. And they are taught from little on up to adulthood that to be justified means to be improved. And you need to be involved in taking the sacraments of the church, and you need to do this, and you need to do that in order to become a justified person. The, the clear teaching of Scripture is that justification is an instantaneous change, a change of identity before a just God, where because of the value of Christ and his death and burial and resurrection, and our putting our trust in him, we are instantaneously changed from death to life. Amazing thing. The point is that God does not need the help of time-consuming processes to do his work. And that also applies to resurrection. All believers will be changed instantaneously. So imagine old Rhonda, new Rhonda, When people in Old Ronda go to bed at night, there's no bridge. They get up the next morning, and the bridge is there. In perfect position, completely worthy of 
passing from one to the other, it's all been completed instantaneously. Were that to occur in real history, people would say there's something afoot. <laughs> we don't understand how this can be. When will this occur? When will this instantaneous transformation occur? Look again at verse 52. It says it will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Now that's very helpful. When is the last trump? It cannot be the last trumpet that has ever sounded in all of history. Nor could it be the last trumpet that is mentioned in the book of Revelation. In, for example, chapter 11 and verse 15, where we have a series of seven trumpets that are sandwiched between seven seals and seven bowls. Because the book of Revelation has not been written out yet, that was written by the Apostle John between 90 after Christ and 100 after Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians is one of Paul's earlier letters, and so it would not be helpful at all to the Corinthians for Paul to make a reference here to the last trump, speaking about a passage of scripture that the Corinthians had never heard of and would not read, maybe ever in their whole lifetime. couple of possibilities. The last trumpet could be a contrast with the first trumpet that is mentioned in Exodus 19, 10 to 20 uh, at the giving of the law. This is the first mention of a trumpet in uh, scripture where the giving of the law is accompanied with a loud trumpet sound to announce the presence of the living God. And so maybe there is a deliberate contrast like you have in chapter 15 between the first Adam and the last Adam in chapter 15 verse 45. Maybe there's a contrast between the first trumpet and the last trumpet. We don't know. Could be that the last trumpet is a metaphor for a military call for the end of battle. I don't know how many of you have served in the military but there is a relationship always between certain trumpet calls and certain actions, right? Um, I think we've done this before, but you know how certain military tunes are immediately associated with a time of day or something that you're supposed to do. Da -da 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 that does not mean it's time to go to bed. Da -da 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 I'm not a military guy, and I never played the bugle in the military, so I don't know all these tunes. But back in those days, uh, huge armies would know what to do because they would hear a certain trumpet call, and, oh, that means we need to go forward. Oh, no, we need to go to the left flank. Uh, halt, or retreat. This, these were kind of internet-type uh, messages, and you didn't look at your phone to see what the general was wanted you to do, you listen to the bugler. There is going to be a final bugle, a final trumpet, which says, battle's over, folks. Could be that the last trumpet is a metaphor for a military call to end a soldier's watch. Individual soldiers would be able to go home and sleep when they heard a certain bugle call. Another possibility. Paul's going to uh, mention the importance of watching in chapter 16, verse 3. Um, we're going to see other references to watchfulness. And when the final trumpet for the church sounds, the watch will conclude. We will not need to be watchful anymore. Some have suggested that the last trumpet is a reference to the Feast of Trumpets in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 24 to 25. I'm not sure. There are a number of possibilities. Maybe 
this is a reference to the Feast um, of Trumpets and the final long trumpet blast, the Feast of Trumpets, which precedes the Great Day of Atonement, which may be a, a type for that last time of Israel's testing in uh, the, the Day of the Lord. We dare not, I believe, be overly dogmatic about which of these images Paul had in mind when he talked about the last trumpet. But we do know in 1 Thessalonians 4 that when Christ comes for the church, the angel will sound trumpet. So I suppose that's the last trumpet. End of the watch, end of the battle for the church, time for us to be with the Lord. God is going to finish history for his people, and when his moment comes, both the dead and the living in Christ will respond to the trumpet's call. How is it going to happen? Look at verse 52. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Two key words. The dead shall be raised, and we shall be changed. Paul, why don't you give us a little more detail? Would you please give us the mechanics? How is God going to do it? The word raised is the same word that you see all the way through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it is the word for resurrection. Our bodies will be like Christ. What happened to Jesus? He had a body just like yours, which was put to death and was buried in a tomb. And then in some way that completely goes beyond what we can understand, his body was transformed and he didn't have to have the Roman soldiers or the temple guard, whichever kind of guard it was, open up the tomb to let him out, nor did the angels have to come to let him out. The angels rolled aside the tomb so that witnesses could come in and see that the tomb was empty. There was a resurrection, which means that the body, which was still a body, became a new kind of body, and at one point you would have seen Jesus' cadaver lying in state, wrapped up in a funeral shroud, and the next instant he was somewhere else with a new body. That's what it means, we will be raised. That new body is going to be suited to a new order of things. And if it is going to be like Christ, we can infer that just as Jesus was able to eat and drink in the presence of the disciples, give me some fish, remember? We will be able to eat and drink. We will be at a banquet in the kingdom age. But we will not be subject any longer to sin. Jesus' body was apparently able to go from point to point without having tra to traverse the distance between point A and point B. That's an inference that we draw from looking at the passage, the passages related to Resurrection Day. There's going to be some continuity with the old, but many things are going to be different. I assume we will be recognized. But that doesn't say everything, right? Because if you look at a picture of me when I was uh, graduated from college, you might have a difficult time recognizing me. Now, to talk to Kathy to see what she thinks the major differences are. So, are we going to resemble ourselves at in our in our prime condition? Or are we going to look like we were when we were transformed? I don't know, but we will be raised. And Christ was recognizable in some ways, although there were people who interacted with him in his resurrection body who did not immediately recognize him. So I don't know exactly how this is going to shake out. But we will be raised. And verse 52 says, we will be changed. This is the term that the author to the letter of the Hebrews would use later on in Hebrews 1.12 to 
to speak about the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. The old will wear out like a garment and be rolled up and thrown away like a worn mantle. It, it will be changed like a garment. It will be made different. Alagusameta. It will be transformed. The new is going to replace the old and the tattered. And in verse 53, he uses a slightly different metaphor. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. He, he uses a word that talks about putting on a new set of clothes. You change your clothes on a regular basis? I think you do. Isn't it nice to put on a new clothes? set of clothes after you have maybe sweated it out all day in hard work and um, well your your shirt just smells of perspiration and if you take a bath and clean up you don't put on that old stinky shirt you put on a fresh new shirt that's the way it's going to be except in a far greater sense and the best suit that we put on is not going to wear out, nor will it ever go out of fashion. Amen. That's good news. I want you to see a very important word we have not underscored, but which Paul does underscore in verse 53. And that's this little four-letter word spelled M-U-S-T. This corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal put on immortality. The Translators include the word must in italics and supply it for clarity. It, but that word is emphasized. It has to happen to get us into God's presence. And the visible manifestation of God's eternal rule in the new heavens and new earth, you must go through this transformation. We're not talking here about something like the uh, bringing back to life of Lazarus. You remember the miracle that Jesus did in John's Gospel, chapter 11? Poor Lazarus. The guy got sick. He died. Jesus didn't come back to heal him. They wrapped him up on a burial shroud, put him in a tomb. He moldered in his grave several days. He began to stink. Jesus says, roll away. No, no, Lord Jesus, he stinketh. <laughs> Behold, he stinketh. <laughs> One of these short statements that is filled with punch. <laughs> and Jesus weeps over the tragedy that sin creates in this battered world. And then says, Lazarus, come out. Good thing he gave Lazarus a direct instruction. Or maybe many more people would have been raised from that uh, cemetery. <laughs> And he comes out. You know, this, this, the sad part of that story is that the poor guy had to die twice. And that's not stated in Scripture, but it, we infer that legitimately because he did not receive this kind of resurrection body. He was just brought back to life in his natural body. And I wonder what kind of stories Lazarus would have told. Did he remember the things that he saw um, in that several days between his first death and his renewed life. It would be interesting to know more about that. Maybe we'll have a chance to interview him in eternity and find out more. Or maybe we won't care. But we're not talking about that kind of change. All believers must receive a resurrection body that cannot die twice. In my preparation these last few months for the, the church history survey, I've been impressed by how from time to time there are revivals in various places. And at a, a broad level in various societies, evil is restrained. The bars are emptied. The dance halls have their doors locked shut. People come together in their families to read the scripture, to pray. There is a new emphasis in various places. But you know it is always temporary, these things. Nothing lasts forever. 
because the freshly committed people to the gospel eventually pass away and new generations arrive who think that they know better and they don't need the faithfulness and moral transformation that their parents and grandparents embraced. And so they go back to the old way of doing things. And it goes over and over, circles and circles, century after century. We don't learn from the foolishness of previous generations. So we need a permanent solution. And that is why all believers need to be not just forgiven, but changed once for all. Otherwise, my friend, we're going to repeat the errors of history forever. That permanent change will happen at the rapture of the church. So if you are a believer today in the Lord Jesus Christ, this coming transformation will not be optional. You don't get extra credit. You don't have to sign up for it. You don't even have to give your opinion as to whether you're interested or not. It will be required. And it will be a happy requirement. What wonderful consequences of God's choice that this is the way he is going to do things. Who on earth would ever wish to opt out of this permanent solution? And then so there is a decisive victory that is explained in verses 54 to 57, and we'll move quickly through this to, in conclusion. Just to emphasize the point, he says in verse 54, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Here's a decisive victory in 54 to 57. Death's victory, which is temporary, will be defeated. Looks like death is victorious. Have, have you noticed that death is victorious? I mean, do you know of any people who've been able to, to, to defeat death? Ever met anybody who has said, well, death, try to finish me off. Go ahead. Death is victorious. Go to the nearest cemetery. You'll find out that death is a, an incredible enemy. And yet this verse says that the day will come when death will be defeated. Its apparent victory will be finished. It reminds us of Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, where it says, In this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will, wait, or will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Paul is alluding to that passage in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 25. Death's stinger will be dispatched. Reference here to Hosea, chapter uh, 13, verse 14. Paul um, taunts death. It, you, you pick that up when you uh, read this rhetorical device. Verse 55. Oh, death, where is thy sting? It is a kind of a soliloquy, almost Hamlet style, you know, holding the skull. I'm going to teach you something. <laughs> you think you're so powerful. Where's your stinger, O oh, death? Grave, where's your victory? Paul does this a number of times in 1 Corinthians. I love how he does that. He does it in the early chapter. He talks about the, the wise man. Hey, you wise man, where are you? I've often thought of Paul saying that into a cave where the 
echo comes back, and the, the, the echo is just Paul's own voice with the question. No one responds. There are no wise men. And there's no response here either from death. Death has lost its stinger. It's been dispatched. It's like a, a scorpion. Do, do you like scorpions? Do you welcome scorpions into your home? They're a charming little beasts, aren't they? That, that, that little curly cue thing on their tail end, this, doesn't that have a certain attraction to you? It, not if you know what a scorpion is. You can have it as a pet, but you better take the stinger out. <coughs> And like a scorpion whose stinger has been ripped out, leaving it just as ugly, but rendering it powerless. So death has been defanged by Christ's resurrection from the dead. When we think about death, we hate the suffering and the separation that it brings. It's ugly. There's nothing attractive in it. We despise it as an abnormal intrusion into God's good creation. Death is an evil thing, but believers need not fear it. Because ultimately death can do us no harm. Death is a doorway, in fact, into a whole new realm of life. And God has ripped the stinger out of death and used death and all of its horrors to open the door into his eternal kingdom. And God does that all the time, you know, with bad things. It's as if he says to the devil, you want to be number one? Go ahead. Let's see your strategy. And the devil comes up with all kinds of neat things, and God flips every one of them over on their back like the ultimate jujitsu artist. And you can't beat him because he takes the worst things that Satan contrives and turns them into blessings for his own people. Yeah. Paul emphasizes a few comments here. Um, in verses 56 and following, think about what that stinger is. It's sin that makes death such a painful experience. And what strengthens sin is the law. Thou shalt not. And what God says, thou shalt not do, we go ahead and do. And the law says, you need to do this. And what the law says, you need to do, we don't do. But thanks be to God, Verse 57, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the victory is. It's in a person, not in a religion. No religion can give you victory over death, but a person can. The only person who has ever had victory over death. Paul finishes the chapter with his dynamic challenge in verse 58. This is where all of this reflection brings us. Number one, don't budge. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. This is a call to inertia. The word steadfast suggests what is solid because it is grounded in rock. There are certain, in thing, certain things in life that you don't want to move. like your house. If there's an, an earthquake, you want your house to be steadfast, right? No movement. Uh, this particular term that's used in the New Testament was used also in classic literature um, before the time of the writing of the New Testament for a person who, was, uh, who spent his time in life sitting. He led a sedentary life. He was steadfast. Uh, some of you have led lives like that. Your job is spent seated in an office. You don't run long distances. You don't use uh, muscles so that you know, you're broad as a door. You're, you have a sedentary life. You don't climb on rooftops. You, you have a steadfast life. It is one place. It's your chair. And in a more metaphorical sense, it meant that a person had a fixed purpose. Be steadfast. Secondly, immovable. That refers to something which cannot be moved from its prior position. 
a person who is involved in apostasy moves away from his prior position, from revealed apostolic truth written in the Bible. And so in other words, Paul is telling the Corinthian believers who are living in a decaying society, don't aim to be progressive. Aim to be a conservative in matters of doctrine and practice by holding on to what you have been given. You don't need to update the message. Be steadfast, unmovable. This is maybe counterintuitive and uh, is not politically correct here in Arroyo Daniel. We need to hear, to heed this call as well. If we want to honor the Lord and hear his well done when we stand before him, we must not drift from sound teaching and holy practice. We could get a few more people to come to services if we were broader in controversial issues or if we made the services and the Bible studies more of a discotheque. But we are going to have to give an account to God for how we build in his church. And so if Paul preached the whole counsel of God and urged his disciples to adhere to it as well, and if the Lord Jesus ordered his followers to teach their disciples to obey everything that he taught them, who are we to trim back the scriptures to a less offensive minimum? Amen. Let's not budge on the truth. Don't budge. Be steadfast, immovable, and then lastly, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't budge, do abound. In the Lord's work, we need to brim over like a, a fizzy bottle of agua con gas. That's well shaken before you open it. Now, don't try that tonight if you go to a restaurant. But you know what happens if you shake a bottle of sparkling water and then open it. I will remember the experience in my youth of my dad bringing home some delicious um, ginger beer. Doesn't sound like something you serve to children, but um, this was not an alcoholic drink. And in the state of Michigan, they made this ginger ale that was absolutely exquisite. And he brought it home from a trip in the summertime, put it on the uh, flat area there beside the sink. I can still see it in my mind's eye. And it sat there for a day or so. And out of the blue, bang! In the heat of the summer, this thing exploded because it was effervescent. We need to be that fizzy, always abounding because that's what the Lord's work in the church should give to us, that kind of enthusiasm. Evangelism, making disciples, a life of worship, day in, day out, prayer, the reading, application of the word, confessing sin, encouraging our brethren. It's not in vain to do that. Abound in it. Sometimes it's toil. The work of the Lord, the word that's used there, the work of the Lord, implies what is sometimes hard and sweat-provoking labor. Sometimes it's grunt work, but abound in it nonetheless. There are some times when a committed Christian who works with people find that they can be obstinate, just like sheep, and there can be exasperating relapses into sin, but it will be worth all of it in the end. Sometimes we get budging and abounding turned around. We won't budge in the work of the Lord, but have no fear of moving away from what the Bible teaches. Now, remembering the truth of the resurrection of the body and our final accountability to God would help us keep things in their right order. So I want to ask myself and ask you this question. Are you committed to steadfastness in believing and applying the truth of God's word, and are you committed to abounding in his work? When you go to important events, they tell you to switch off your cell phone, right? You notice that? You're supposed to give the event or the meeting your complete 
attention and make sure that nobody else is distracted either. No interruptions allowed. But that's not the way God wants us to live our lives. We're supposed to keep our ears open for the last trumpet. Listen for the trumpet call. Because if we keep the cell phone turned on in that respect and have our ears tuned for the moment that he returns, it's going to affect how we live our lives in the course of the day. There's a deep valley that has been crossed by Christ. The kingdom of God is coming. Eternal life one day will be ours. An indestructible bridge has been already set up, the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're talking about the bridge of the transformation of the body. It will occur instantaneously at the last trumpet. We will be raised, we will be changed, and this must occur to get us to the other side. Death's victory will be completed. The stinger of death will be dispatched. And so we are called not to budge, but to abound in the Lord's work. May God help us to do that this week as we move into the autumn months and to, to give our time and energy to those things that are going to have eternal significance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father, for this passage of Scripture. There's much here for us to meditate on. Thank you for the hope that it gives us and the confidence that we have in Christ. Thank you that he is the door, that he is the way, that he is the truth and the life. And we thank you that one day we are going to experience um, going over this ultimate bridge from the old to the new, the bridge of the transformation of the body, and that we will not have to go back to what we were before. Thank you that Christ guarantees this to every person who has put his trust simply in Christ and what he has done for us once for all at the cross. We give you thanks for this good gift in Jesus' name.